Great, thanks for the uh, grand entrance. Beautiful music to start off with. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Ben Strick. Um, you can call me Ben, there's my Twitter account details up the top there, I pretty much live on Twitter. Um, great to be back here at Perugia. Uh, it's been closed for a few years, but it's awesome to have the community back here again. Lots of coffees, lots of pizzas, lots of drinks, and lots of learning cool stuff. Hopefully I can show you with you some cool stuff that we've been working on over the past few years as well, right? While everyone's been in lockdown, we haven't been able to travel to specific locations, right? And so a lot more open source work has been done, Google Maps, Google Earth, getting footage from war zones as well, places that we can't get into. So I'm gonna go through a lot of that today. Um, I work for a NGO called the Center for Information Resilience. So we expose disinformation attempts, we document human rights abuses, and we look at the space in between that, right? Where this differs. So you've probably seen things come out of Ukraine recently about Butcher. That's a perfect case study of what we're actually trying to look at here. Um, I'm a contributor with Bellingcat as well. I used to be with a group called BBC Africa Eye. So you'll see some of their examples. So if you've seen them already, uh, please switch off and don't absorb them because they're quite graphic. Um, I just, getting on the, on the topic of graphics, so I do have a little disclaimer. There is graphic content in here. I don't work with cats and dogs, sadly. I work with war zones, conflict events, and things like that, quite serious stuff. Um, so I just wanted to sort of give you that pre-warning. So I'm not going to waste your time today. I really want to cover some specific points, right? And what I'm going to go through is about geojournalism, right? Using satellite imagery and maps and cool bits of location data and how that might fit in a story is the first thing we'll go through. The second thing is what sort of data we have access to. So if you want to get in touch with me later, I can share these slides with you in case you don't get to take notes or anything like that as well, because I do talk fast. Um, the third thing is how do we actually do the work? So I kind of, oopsie, I kind of wanted to make this a little bit of a practical session. Um, don't worry, you don't have to get out your keyboards and start rattling away. Uh, but I wanted to go through some of the things that we do, right? So answering simple questions like where something happened, when it happened, what happened, and why is it important? Now, the reason why I left who off there is because that probably takes about three weeks to learn. There's lots of little different things about attribution, but I didn't want to get into that right now because I only have 50 minutes and definitely no questions and answers with that. Um, cool. So before we tuck in... I wanted to kind of show you guys how some of this stuff might fit in a storytelling method. Don't worry, I'm not only going to show you things from the BBC with cool, slick graphics and stuff like that. I'm going to show you homegrown stuff as well that you can do for cheap, like what I usually do. Um, but this is a, a something that we worked on at BBC Africa Eye. It was an investigation that was based out of Cameroon. This was the video. I'm going to play a segment of it for you. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's quite graphic. Some of you might have seen this on your Twitter feeds in 2018, right? We've got audio with this, so you can hear that they're French speaking. They're introducing their friends as they walk down this dusty Sahelian track, right? And what you're seeing is a lot of antagonizing men. Some of them have weapons, some of them have big sticks, some of them are wearing military clothing. And they're slapping oh, these women ash. and their children as they walk down this path. Now this lady even has a baby tied onto her back. It's quite a chilling video when you think about what's probably going to happen when you see this, right? I'm not going to play you the rest because it's damaging to your mental health if you actually watch this kind of stuff. Um, most of you have probably seen quite graphic stuff in your times as reporters, journalists and researchers and investigators. Essentially what they do is they kneel the women and children down, they blindfold them and they shoot them 21 times, right? They film the whole thing as they go through. So it's kind of good, this footage, because we can catch out the baddies Thankfully, they didn't, they did film it, otherwise we would never know about this. But at the same time, these sorts of chilling events do happen. Luckily, this one was caught on camera. So in going through this, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, because you, many of you have probably seen this on the BBC or YouTube, 
I want to give you a bit of behind the scenes kind of view as to how some of these have played out. So this was a, a, a video that was shared and a group of us got together in a little Twitter DM, about seven to eight or 10 of us got together. So some of us have random Twitter accounts, uh, like little uh, pictures of teddy bears and stuff on Twitter. Some of us are with Amnesty International or Bellingcat or BBC. And we dived together into this Twitter DM of all places, very unorganized, and we were really pissed about this footage, right? Uh, sorry for the live stream. Um, and, and so what we did was we started to look at these questions that we wanted to do. We had some sort of power, right? So we wanted to have a look at where this happened, when this happened, what happened, and who is responsible, right? The core questions of accountability. The interesting thing about this is that when this video first came out, the Cameroonian government said it was fake news, it was fake footage, and that it wasn't filmed in Cameroon. Quite similar to what we've seen done by Russia recently, right? So we thought, okay, we'll stuff you, Cameroonian government, we're gonna prove you wrong. So first of all, we had a look at something uh, like answering the question of where this was filmed. Now, sadly, this wasn't shot in Paris with an Eiffel Tower in the background, so <laughs> we don't really have easily identifiable objects, but what we do have is a mountain range. It's quite difficult to look for mountain ranges in Cameroon because there's lots of them, but what we can do is a little fatigue or, or a ridge line like that, and then we have a look around on Google Earth that everyone has access to. It's a freely available tool. Look for cafes and restaurants and where human rights abuses are filmed. So what we do is we scroll through Google Earth and we have a look at these ridge lines and see if they can match that up. And that was an exact match of this location that was just off the border of Nigeria, specifically northeast Nigeria, Borno State, lots of Boko Haram activity. It's why that guy was saying, you are Biach, which is Boko Haram. These were refugees being pushed out of Nigeria into Cameroon, and lo and behold, they get executed by the military. So we'd like to drill down a little bit further into details, right? Because as investigative journalists, what we're trying to do is get as much information out of a video as possible. So going forward, we have a ridge line, that's cool, but we want to match things up a little bit more, always drilling down into minute details. For example, we're able to match this path that we can see with the little kink and, and the bend in the line there. These buildings, these are the buildings that you can see, and even to the point where we can start matching up trees that we can see on satellite imagery and in the video, right? Because the Cameroonian government was denying what happened here, we were so annoyed that we wanted to match up every single tree we could find on a satellite image to say, ha ha, try and misprove that one, guys. So then we started to go into the question of when this was filmed. It was uploaded in 2018, but it could have been filmed any time. Um, we thought it was actually quite recent at the start. So what we did was we started to use satellite imagery again to draw new findings, right? And these new findings were when this was filmed. Now, the way we can do this is we've got past satellite imagery, right? So there's lots of satellite images available of a certain location. Once you have that location, you can look at an archive of satellite imagery. It's quite useful because we can scroll back in time and match up what buildings were w there when they weren't there as well. It's kind of like playing that little kid's game of spot the difference, only it's kind of a grown-up version for journalists. So we were able to see that that building was not there in 2014, but it was there in 2016, similar to these buildings as well, and we're able to narrow that window of time down to late 2014 and early 2016. So we're getting a window of time, which is quite useful. But that's not all. I mean, that's a pretty big gap, right? You know, late 2014, early 2016. It's not the sort of stuff that's quite evidential. So we wanted to go a little bit further. Has anyone ever here seen a sundial before, like in a park, you know, a sundial? Hands up, anyone? Yeah, I see a couple of nods. Cool, yeah, everyone knows how it works. So sundials are usually these little concrete objects, right, in the park that cast a little shadow. The object itself is quite useless, kind of like this guy, a human rights abuser but let's make him useful and turn him into a sundial. We can do that because he casts a shadow, right? That shadow is caused by the direction of sunlight, which is quite handy because that's only at specific times of specific years that we can actually draw that inference. So we were able to narrow this down to within April to May 2015, right? This was a video that was uploaded in 2018. So now we have the exact location that everyone denied, 
we have a very close window of time, and now we can start to use that information, or as some people allege, intelligence, because they think we're all spies for the MI5, um, to actually draw this down and start to identify who might be responsible. So we can start to do that for a number of things, such as weapons identification. I mean, this weapon system I have not seen many times in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a Serbian weapon, the Zastava M21. Cameronian government claimed that they weren't used by their soldiers, but lo and behold, we have pictures of soldiers up there, uploaded on Facebook, thank you guys, um, with the same sort of weapon system, which is quite useful. The Cameronian government said that those uniforms are not used in that part of the world. Again, soldiers on Facebook, even Snapchat and Twitter, uh, uploading pictures of themselves in their uniforms uh, within a five kilometre radius of where this actually happened. What we were also able to do, and I'll go into this in a little bit, is we were able to actually look at what's around an event. And this is quite useful for satellite imagery because you're able to get a situational awareness of what other things exist in the area. For example, there might be a nearby military base which is about 880 metres away, or a combat outpost, I should call it, that actually has people from specific units that use that weapon system, that wear that uniform as well. By matching that up with the times, we're actually able to start to identify who might have been there. So who was chilling in the base, taking selfies and working out and trying to uh, flex about what they actually did in the, in the big Nigerian and North Cameroonian conflict and safeguarding and all that sort of stuff. And we're able to identify three specific men. Now, this is interesting because the Cameroonian government started to put out names of people that might have been responsible. There was no shred of evidence whatsoever. They were kind of, you know, they just didn't have any evidence to these names. But three of these people were actually these guys. And it was quite handy to independently document this. Now, the Cameroonian government was saying that they were still investigating this case. After we published this documentary, there were a number of attempts to actually try these guys. And then eventually, in 2020, four of those soldiers were jailed for 10 years. Now, 10 years is a pretty crappy uh, sentence, in my opinion, for killing uh, women and children and executing them. But it's some level of justice and accountability, right? And I'm going to go into this a little bit more about some of these cases and stories. But as you'll start to see, in some of these places, even if there's no justice and accountability, the power that we have as investigative journalists is giving representation to victims. And at the end of the day, those, four, those women and children are the ones that we actually do this work for, right? I'm going to go on to another one. It's about a, a live stream massacre that we had in Sudan in 2019, which is very sad because it's such a beautiful country. It happened in Khartoum, one of the most beautiful cities in my opinion. And these were three live streams that were uploaded online. Again, the government claimed this was all fake and, and they didn't kill anyone innocent uh, whatsoever. And the internet was actually cut for the following two weeks after this event. But we're able to pull these three Facebook live streams out of this. I'm going to introduce you in a bit to one of the live streamers who became a little bit of our friend at Africa Eye. Um, we quite love this guy, we call him Mr. Pink Shirt. In live stream one, it was quite useful doing this sort of stuff because Facebook live streams have timestamps, which is quite handy. So we're able to start to identify exactly what time gunshots started, what time attacks started. So we're able to map the entire path of where they moved and identify that movement of paramilitary forces and police as they, as they move through, through the footage of the live streams, which is quite nice to give that level of representation to these people as they were filming this content to amplify the human rights abuses that they wanted to expose. So Livestreamer 1 was being charged towards by the paramilitary and he was uh, running away from that. And we jump into now Livestreamer 2 who thought, okay, let's be brave guys, let's charge towards these paramilitary with all these guns. Livestreamer 2 runs up along this train track here, and we're about to see our friend for the first time. Livestreamer 1, Mr. Pink Shirt. And what we can do is we can jump into his phone and start having a look at what Livestreamer 1 looks like again. So we'll jump in there. There's our friend, Mr. Pink Shirt. Fast forward a bit because I don't want to waste your time. And now we're going to have a look at where some of the worst occurrences happen. 
but we're going to look at that through Livestreamer 3's phone. Now there's Livestreamer 1 and 2, so we can verify that they were filming in that location. Livestreamer 3, take it away. Great, now we're able to see the conflict actually take out. And this is a really nice way to make sense of chaotic footage, right? Using satellite imagery, adding pins on a map, and allowing these stories to be told by locations so that we can make clear sense of it for an audience. Um, as I said, we made a little bit of a friendship with this guy, and after we actually posted this video, he sent us uh, this photo. Um, he was shot in the chest, uh, but there he is with a big smile and posing with the little bullet uh, in, in his uh, x-ray right there. And this was a, a video um, he sent us afterwards. He was in the hospital, <laughs> and he was saying, uh, I'm going to continue, uh, so I'm very well, and I'm going to continue protesting for democracy, right? And for me, I got quite upset after this documentary because there was no admission from the government whatsoever. There was no in, in independent investigation. There was no justice and accountability met whatsoever. But again, it goes back to this representation of victims, right? And it's people like this that we do this work for day in, day out. Um, cool. So those are some slick graphics from the BBC. Now I'm going to show you something a little bit raw and dirty. Um, this is an Acheli project, which is uh, something that we did for Myanmar. Um, it was actually ran by a person up in the back room there, uh, Kaylee, who's sitting there. Um, so thankfully, I was involved in it. Um, and, and what we were looking at, I mean, there's a beautiful patch of, of area up in northwest uh, uh, Rakhine State, um, where the Rohingya are, were, and uh, it, it's, it's a rich area because of the diversity in religion, the diversity in, in cultural buildings and communities and things like that. What we were seeing is we felt like witnesses when we looked at Google Earth, satellite imagery available to everyone. We were seeing villages burnt down to the ground, entire things wiped away. Village after village after village wiped down systematically, right? This is quite upsetting because we felt like we were witnesses to human rights abuses here. So we wanted to do something about it. Again, we had no funding whatsoever and we worked with a group of university students to do this, but we mapped out every single building through Google Earth that was burnt down and also when they were destroyed as well. We built a beautiful spreadsheet for those of you that love uh, Google Spreadsheets or Excel um, with thousands of entries of different villages and buildings that were burnt down to the ground. This is actually available, so you can look at it on your phones or anything like right now. It's called the Acelli Project. Um, it was turned into a, a beautiful uh, illustration by a nice little uh, US-based group that basically took our free work and, and made a nice uh, a, a website out of it for free, which is cool. Um, but because of that underlying data that we put out there publicly, uh, using that satellite imagery, journalists have now been able to make new findings about villages, have been able to identify new bits of footage, and even the UN and independent monitoring mechanisms are using this sort of work that a group of university students and ourselves doing this in our late nights were able to dig up, right? So we're able to identify more than 38,000 destroyed buildings, right? Which is pretty important when you think about this as someone that's chilling on a couch in London looking at, at, at Google Earth and, and feeling like a witness to these, these abuses, which is the power of satellite imagery. Um, I wanted to leave this graphic with you to show you the importance of what happened here because not only were those villages burnt down, but afterwards they were bulldozed as well. So it's enough to burn down a house, but when you bulldoze it and try to clear the land of any signs, there's no preservation of evidence. The only evidence we have here is satellite imagery, which is the power of that effect. I'm going to take you into something that we're working on at the moment. It's a uh, project called... Thanks, man. Um, it's a project called Eyes on Russia, because we all have Eyes on Russia. Um, and this is our focus on Ukraine. It really started up in December when we started seeing lots of tanks and things like that driving around on the backs of trains. Uh, early in January and then February, shots fired, right? and conflict and rages. I'm going to show you a little bit of footage. Um, maybe you want to turn the audio off. I didn't realize the, yeah, there's probably some Russian hardcore music on there. Um, this is from a farmer in Western Russia too, so don't blame him for his music taste. Cool. So what we're seeing here is up on the back right, you can see this kind of straight cloud firing out of, or I should say coming out of the ground. Um, 
This was filmed by a, a, a Russian farmer just in, in southwest of Belgorod. Uh, for those of you that know the area, it was uploaded on TikTok, not far from Kharkiv, um, which is obviously someone, uh, something that everyone knows about, that sort of town. This is quite interesting footage, and it was identified by a member of, our, uh, of the community that we're working with at the moment in this mass mapping effort that we're working on to verify footage and log it. It's called uh, the Russia-Ukraine monitor map. You can look at it on your phones, on your laptops. Everything is available. But footage like this is quite important for us because we need to make sense of it. Now, we can give that a location, but we can also look at satellite imagery. The power of satellite imagery is quite interesting here because if you have a look at this, I won't even give you sound effects of a rocket, but pium. Um, that cloud coming out out of there definitely isn't a natural cloud. So this was identified by another member of the community, and this is quite interesting because it's in a very similar spot to where we saw that footage coming out from as well. These are further satellite images that we were able to obtain and analyze with these little black scorch marks on the ground over and over again within a 500, to one, 500 meter to one kilometer radius from this place in Russia. The direction of these, as you can see from the direction of that cloud fire, the direction of that video, all points to some specific places. Now, first of all, they were all located around this specific town, which is south of Belgorod, within Russia, I should point out, that's an important point here. And they're all, most of them, scattered around, firing into a place called Kharkiv, which many of you are probably aware of, is a place that was pounded towards the end of February, and even more so in the past few weeks as well. These red indicators are civilian casualties, are civilian infrastructure damage, and things like that. So this is a project that we've been working on with the whole community, including Bellingcat and other organisations coming together because this is such an important topic for us to get this information into newsrooms and also to archive this for justice and accountability purposes. So we're able to also other things like tracking specific units that might have been there, that were transported there in December, in January, and things like that, which starts to lead up to that most important question, right? Who is responsible? Um, through the power of just a simple map, We've also had volunteers translate this into Russian and get it out into Russia. And when I always speak about justice and accountability not succeeding and representing the victims and representing audiences, the Russian public is one of the most important audiences because without VPNs, the things that they see on news are very different to what they see here. And having this content translated into Russian and dispersed throughout Russian media agencies and, and Russian social media groups, um, Telegram, um, is quite useful for us because we can get truth to the audiences that matter. Cool. So I've talked a little bit about how you can use satellite imagery and mapped data in specific investigations, storytelling and making new findings. Now I want to go on to what data we might have access to. So obviously, first of all, and pretty much everyone here, news agencies, right? Local news agencies, international news agencies, citizen bloggers, love them. Um, but also social media, text, images, and videos. Now, this is a, a photo um, that I wanted to share with you. It's a selfie from a guy on, on Facebook that I was following for a bit. He was posing in Libya a lot, um, often trying to, uh, you know, talk like, hey, look at me, you know, I take protein powder, I'm a cool dude, you know, always posing with weapon systems, trying to chat up a lot of girls as well on Facebook, which is kind of, you know, like, hey, cutie, and all that sort of stuff. And here's a really cool picture that he was posing with uh, here as well, right? Nice selfie. Um, these are some vehicles that have been delivered from Turkey, so accidental breach of an arms embargo in that selfie there, but oopsie. Um, that photo actually ended up in a UN report, which is kind of cool. Um, so that guy was kind of showing off and yeah, used for alternative purposes. But there's a satellite image on the right taken at the, uh, the same day that we can see those vehicles on there. They're BMC vehicles from Turkey, um, and that was a nice little report about a breach of arms embargo, oops. So obviously we have other things, right? So flight tracking data. Um, I wanted to share this one with you. This is the uh, RELAX flight from Air Moldova. Um, it was actually a chartered flight that people bought tickets for and they didn't know where it was gonna go, but they knew it was gonna be special. And it spelt out the word RELAX, which is quite nice for people's mental health. Um, but yeah, flight radar is also awesome. 
Shipment data is awesome, right? And vessel tracking data. So this is something that's uh, it's marine traffic, which for those of you that don't use, you should probably use if you're tracking Russia, especially oligarchs. Uh, this is a, a satellite image that was posted of uh, a very nice vessel called the Nord, uh, owned by one of Russia's richest people, uh, also a chief funder of Putin. Uh, this is it in the Seychelles. It was allegedly seized, and then it ended up in a place called Vladivostok, which is in Russia, so oops. Um, and it was there as of March 31, so about eight days or nine days ago, um, which is quite cool, so we know where it is. Huh? Um, Obviously, geospatial data is a really cool one. So this is like data you would find on maps. Um, does anyone drink beer here? Hands up. Yeah, cool. Do you want to know where good beer is? Yeah. There's a really cool app called Untapped. Um, it's a beer review app. It's like a crowdsource app. And that's the uh, view on the right for Perugia, even. So you can imagine in cities, like big Western cities, this is quite a popular app, right? People post selfies, they have their own personal details on here. Um, some of the volunteer work I've done with Western law enforcement groups, where we've tracked sexual offenders and child sex offenders, has actually seen raging success with apps like this, where we're able to identify nearby locations. If those of you want to do some cool stuff, have a look at the Pentagon or things like that. I think Bellingcat even did an article about that. Or local spy agencies, MI5, beer houses near there. See who's been reviewing consistently. It's kind of cool. Um, so Wikimap here is a really cool one. Uh, I did this conference in Oslo recently, and some people were actually asking me, like, hey, I need to find schools for my kids, and there's not many on Google Maps. But if you go to Wikimap here, you can see there's a lot more schools. So for those of you looking for schools with kids, um, just don't trust Google. Oh, wait, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, so this is a, a really nice one that I wanted to sort of point out. It's NASA firm's data firm, like strong, um, hard. Um, so it's a, it's a heat signature sensing system. Satellites run around the world, and they, they run around regularly, and they pick up this heat signature data, right? It has to hit a certain temperature before it can get picked up. Freely accessible, anyone can look at it. It's updated daily. Now, this is a view of Mariupol. Um, between March 20 and March 25, specifically when there were lots of bombings and fires in Mariupol. Um, this has also been great for us in the future work of the Acheli project, where we've been identifying Burmese villages being burnt down as of the past few months, right? So this has a huge amount of applications. Also, if you're into environmental journalism, this is pretty kick-ass, just as a like starting point as well. Um, now, obviously, the cool stuff, satellite imagery that everyone wants to know about. So first of all, we've got Google Earth with a little time slider on it. So you know that's cool to click, because you can go back and view places in the past. So cool that even, um, I mean, it's, it's sometimes restricted in certain areas. So for me, I, I did a lot of research in Afghanistan in the past, and Google Earth was always blurred. As of August, when coalition forces pulled out, hey, um, this basically became clear. So we're able to map every single video down to 50 centimeter imagery, which is quite handy to watch what the Taliban are doing. Um, so Google made a really good move there. So clear to the point where we could also view historical imagery. So there's two jets flying into Bagram Air Base that we're able to view down there. I thought that was kind of a cool shot. Um, but yeah, Google Earth is quite handy. Going into the cooler stuff, so that picture that I showed you of Mariupol from NASA firms data, this is called Sentinel Hub. It's freely available. Sentinel satellites fly around three to five days every single week. Um, and they're able to capture lots of interesting data that you probably might not get your hands on through Google Earth and might cost you a lot in other places. So for any newsrooms here that are asking like open source analysts to do cool stuff with satellite imagery, they're basically going onto this free site and they're charging you 300 euro a day. Um, this is kind of a cool one to get your hands on. These are fires that are burning, burning in Mariupol, right? Um, very easy to access. It's called Sentinel Hub. Sentinel like a big cool robot out of X-Men and Hub like a cab, car cab. Um, so this is paid high resolution imagery, usually costs a lot, but Maxar seems to be putting out a lot of free content online. So for the Ukraine watchers here, this would be uh, quite synonymous with what's coming out on Twitter. So good, uh, in fact, that you can see such detail, right? So this is 35 centimeter imagery 
of the drama theatre in Mariupol, where you can see the back of it's been clearly uh, condensed in the back or, or caved in at the back. And that Russian or Cyrillic uh, wording that you can see up there, does anyone know what that says? Yeah. Yeah, children, right? Oh, sorry, that was Q&A, sorry. Um, yeah, children, I'll say. <laughs> Um, which is pretty horrific, right? And that's the power of that sort of satellite imagery, which is quite handy. For those of you that are in newsrooms that can't afford Maxar subscriptions, you can hit up someone called, actually I won't say his name, you can hit up the media department of Maxar and they'll actually work with you to get satellite imagery for your investigations as well. Um, contact me later and I can pass you some contact details. I'm aware this is probably live. Um, so we also have Planet as well, right? Um, same thing applies to Planet. So they're a little bit uh, more affordable in their subscription packages. Um, so we have a Planet subscription. Uh, the BBC have a Planet subscription that I used to work with, and they, they actually do custom packages as well. Um, yeah, I should be talking about this. Hit me up later, and I can give you the contact details of the uh, person that can get you free satellite imagery from there. We also have other data as well. Um, so other data are things like, for example, CCTV cameras, right? Uh, so there's a really cool uh, application out there called Shodan, S-H-O-D-A-N. It allows you to look for specific IP addresses, IoT, things like that. So a lot of people in the room are probably like, oh, this is so boring. But it's kind of cool when you start to think, okay, maybe we could look for CCTV cameras that are not password protected, right? So that area near Belgorod, where they're firing from, is actually a place that also has good CCTV coverage from farmers that want to watch animals or want to watch their property when they're not there as well, right? Just accidentally, it seems like Russia has set up a military base there. So we're able to watch 24-7 footage of them as they sort of chill around that area. Um, let me play a cool little video that I was watching the other day. So these are like these alleged uh, elite soldiers and they're building a little communications hub on one of these buildings. Um, and I thought this was nice to share with you guys. This will probably end up on some news site somewhere, probably. Um, but it just goes to show some of the sort of internal training and safety and development for uh, Russian military to get things on a roof. Sadly, it doesn't always work. Um, so that was a bit of a... You can imagine, like, all the sandbags are trying to get to the roof there, poor things. That was probably a really crappy order from some sergeant. Um, yeah, and that's accessible through mapped CCTV cameras, right? So it just adds to that picture of what you're able to get on the ground if you start using these sorts of maps uh, in journalism, which is cool. So I've covered what data we have and how you can use it in a story, but how you can actually go through it. Um, I thought we'd sort of, you know, go a little bit through some of the practical senses of some of the, some of the techniques available. Um, and this is to answer simple questions, right? Such as, where did it happen? When did it happen? What happened? And again, bigger picture, why is it important? So going back through where did it happen, and I'll go back to Ukraine here. So this is a video that was um, uploaded online not, uh, uh, in, in the past month. Um, it was sent to us personally by the person that filmed it. Sadly, they didn't have any coordinates. They they couldn't give us an adequate description of where it was filmed, so it's hard for us to verify this information, right? And we always have to do this separately and cross-check. So for those of you that, and, and I know some of you put your hand up already, saying you've done Google Earth, you're probably thinking, oh, what shapes can I see, right? This is kind of, I like this example because it's quite useful to think about the snowfall, the dark lines, and what sort of jigsaw piece this might look like on, on Google Earth, right? This is also important because you think about this, these are Russian firing positions, firing into specific cities. We've only got this footage on its own, but if we got this footage, matched it up with the location of where they're firing to, matched up that time, we're able to identify the possible victims at the other end. Now, this is an MLRS system, which is quite sad to see because those systems are not made for human consumption. They're not nice when they hit civilian areas. So having a look at this, um, I think there's a nice sort of way to sense patterns out of here. I drew this kind of pattern here, and it looks like someone having like a cool dance with a few beers in Perugia or something like that with one leg out, right? Um, and you can start to think about what this would look like on satellite imagery, right? 
So if we were to go to Google Earth, you could fly around for a little bit in the area that we thought it was going to be filmed in, and lo and behold, we have a match. So this allows us to verify that location or just say, yeah, we know this, where this was roughly. We can drill down into the details, right? We want to know exactly where that system was firing from. Um, so we have specific buildings like this cool little red building with the cool little doors and windows that we can even see on Google Earth right there, and this roof as well. So now we know exactly where that system was firing from. We could have a look at perhaps the direction. So he was about there when it was firing. So we could have a look at the direction of fire. Now this is quite interesting because I went to Kharkiv already, right, with this sort of example that we looked at. We had a look at the firing positions from Russia into Kharkiv. This is in Ukraine and is also firing into Kharkiv. So what we have is another firing point into that same city from within Ukraine. So it's not only firing from within Russia, it's firing from within Ukraine as well, which helps us with storytelling because we've seen a lot of media reports about shellings in Kharkiv, bombings in Kharkiv, but what new information can we add to that? Well, now we can start to identify where this is coming from, which is an important aspect. It's new news and it's important information. Plus, when we identify firing positions, we put that on the map straight away and the Ukrainians love it. Um, We've seen some of them bombed pretty much straight away after we've uploaded that, but I shouldn't say that too loud. Uh, cool. So when did it happen? I mean, this is a really important question to ask, right? Again, looking at Kharkiv, what we're able to do, and this is from Sentinel Hub as well, you can create a time lapse of satellite images. So like you would for the sunset over Perugia when you create a time lapse on your phone, it's multiple images strung together. You can do the same thing with satellite imagery. So what we have here over the space of the 17th to, uh, the, sorry, the 12th to the 22nd of March is impact signs of shelling in residential areas just northwest of Kharkiv. The little black spots that you see forming on there are little shelling spots where rounds have landed over and over again. This is a really good indication to show just how many rounds have landed in these sorts of areas, which is quite helpful for portraying that image of volume and content that's been dropped into that area. So what happened? This is a really good question. Um, and I want to dive into a little bit more of a case study, something that's been quite recent. And this is about the bombing of an airport in western Ukraine, Venetia Airport. Some of you might have seen this one, um, which is great. So this is the footage that the Ukrainian government put out. Um, it was quite popular, it was quite widely shared, it was quite popular online, and it was a verified story in a sense. Yep, Venezia Airport was bombed, we don't know where from, we don't necessarily know what did it, uh, or anything like that. But we know it was targeted, uh, and we have some allegations from the Ukrainian government. What else can we identify using satellite imagery, using these simple methods that we've identified, right? So this was the sort of focus of the footage that came out online at the time. But there were other videos that were less popular and a little bit neglected. Videos that looked like these. Now, I don't know if you guys can see this, but what you're seeing is like, I mean, you could do a guessing game. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a caliber cruise missile or something like that, right? And what you can see is it's flying through. You can also see, um, I don't know those of you that like Ukrainian churches, I mean, I think they're quite beautiful buildings, actually. They're quite old and historic. But you can see one on the right there when it pops up at the bottom of the frame. And you can see one right here with like a little blue roof. They all have their own design and they're quite lovely to look at, especially the insides of them on Google Maps, uh, but I won't go there. But what we're looking at here are sort of features that we can recognise or features that we might have near Venezia Airport, for example, because that was uploaded at the same day, same time. Cool. So we went ahead and geolocated these to identify, hmm, can we maybe find where this is coming from? And we married that up with the impact point of Venezia Airport. We had one sighting of a caliber cruise missile here with the Blue Roof Church. We had one sighting of a caliber cruise missile here with this sort of big clock tower and large spire church as well. And we're able to identify that straight line of fire coming from Moldovan airspace, which is quite cool. And that sort of started to identify not only what happened, but where it came from and what sort of answers that might have drawn out of that too, right? Which is quite fascinating to sort of see 
that original information that can be drawn out of satellite imagery and just getting things on a map. Um, yeah, that was quite handy. So going back and circling back to why is this important, I think there's a couple of things to think about here, right? And we've all seen that from Butcher recently. Verified information on the ground, footage of bodies on the ground, clearly dead bodies, um, satellite imagery posted, thankfully, from New York Times via Maxar, and yet we still see the Russian government deny and claim that it's fake footage, fake events that are happening on the ground, right? So you can see how this starts to really help in journalistic storytelling as well as justice and accountability, right? So it's informing and assisting media. Um, my purpose, I'm actually originally a, a journalist, but you know, so I'm not out to say, let's all do open source and ditch journalism, but rather you can use it to amplify your stories and to make new findings and use it in your own toolkit as journalists, right? Um, obviously, justice and accountability mechanisms are great. So I've moved to an NGO to do this work specifically for justice and accountability, assisting the UN, assisting judicial organizations, humanitarian relief efforts, and things like that. Um, because it's, it's great to sort of have that sense of power when you're, when you're assisting groups like that. I think one of the biggest things is about how the fact that we can show the evidence and not just tell it. So if I was to take you back to that first video of Cameroon, and I was to say, hey, yeah, these are Cameroonian soldiers. It was filmed in this location at this time. You'd be like, well, I don't believe you, show me, right? And that's a good way to fight disinformation attempts and different state narratives. But I think the most important one at the end of the day, and what I sort of love doing this work for, is the representation of victims. And that second video that I showed you um, from Sudan really sort of hits home for me. We got sent this video after that, and it's quite interesting. I've been in touch with this little family. So this is a, this is a mother, her, her little boy, um, and her uncle was filming this. And I'll play this video for you in a bit. We're in touch with them because they said when that documentary came out, we, we had news reports coming out which were helpful, but we were able to use this as evidence to show what happened to us on those specific days, to show the persecution we've been under by the government, by the paramilitary and groups like that. Really interesting because after our documentary came out, the military started to counter paramilitary forces when they started to kill people. And so this was filmed during a gunfight. Guys, it's probably going to be quite loud. Um, good, it's not too loud. Ah, no audio. <laughs> You can hear the gunfire over the background. The mum is saying to her little boy, they're just playing, they're just playing, it's fine. Um, and the uncle says, go like that, go peace. And so the uncle is saying, we should play this back to him one day because he'll probably be out of the vote one day. And it's that sort of information that I think there's been no court case, there's been no justice and accountability but those people are still out battling it out on the streets and it's for those little kids that are trying to fight for democracy in the future, right, that are able to vote one day. So my name is Ben Strick, that's Geojournalism and thank you for attending.